Hi, this is Lit with Chris, and today we're looking at whether Niels Krogstad can really be considered the antagonist of Henrik Ibsen's A Doll's House. If you need more analysis of literature that you're covering in school like this, or book recommendations, then be sure to like and subscribe via the links below. So, in less than 10 quotes, here is my empathic character analysis of why Niels Krogstad is mostly a misunderstood man. In Act 1, Krogstad establishes his supposed position as the play's antagonist when he sneaks into the Helmer household in order to confront Nora. Her reaction and general behaviour around him implies a sense that Krogstad is in some way dangerous or insidious and that he means harm to the protagonist's family. However, the crime that Krogstad has committed, which causes him to sneak around like a social pariah, is diminished by the man himself when he states that the matter never came into court, but every way seemed to be closed to me after that. This reveals that the offence, most likely some sort of fraud, was not serious enough for Krogstad to go to jail, nor even stand trial in a court of law. Yet due to moral attitudes around money and professional honesty during the 19th century, Krogstad has been made an outcast by his peers and neighbours. However, far from languishing in resentment, he has made attempts to re-establish his name, most notably for his family, whom he references when saying that my sons are growing up. For their sake, I must try and win back as much respect as I can in the town. This approach to fatherhood is a far cry from that of Torvald Helmer, who rarely, if ever, shows an interest in his three children except when announcing that Nora is to no longer spend time with them once he learns of her indiscretion in Act 3. Lastly, a key debate in the opening act is whether or not Krogstad's misdemeanour should be seen any differently from that of Nora's. Nora seems appalled at the suggestion that she and Krogstad are similar in some way, yet both have gone against the law to acquire money in a time of need. Although the audience undoubtedly sympathises with Nora's position, Krogstad points out that the law cares nothing about motives, meaning that should people learn of her illegally gotten money, there would be no difference between what he did and what Nora has done in the eyes of the courts. Here, Ibsen might be calling upon the audience to consider whether or not a person, such as Krogstad, or Nora for that matter, can really be seen through the lens of these two polar opposites of good or bad. Although Krogstad has made a mistake, he's clearly not an evil person and doesn't seem to be deserving of the widespread rejection or condemnation that he seems to be receiving at this point in the play. Even if he does come across as embittered or a desperate man, we can empathise why, given the way that Dr Rank and Nora both talk about him in harsh and judgmental fashions, despite their own personal respective failings. The key difference here is that Krogstad's dishonesty or dishonour is public knowledge. The unsavoury aspects of the other characters in the play are not yet known to everyone else. In Act 2, Krogstad's return to the Helmer household enhances the sense of anxiety and desperation pervading Nora's life. After learning of his dismissal, the supposed antagonist returns to pile pressure on the protagonist in order to not only keep his job, but now also to secure a promotion. Nora's first instinct is to plead for mercy on behalf of her children, yet Krogstad adroitly responds by asking whether you and your husband thought of mine. This once again places Krogstad's experience alongside Nora's in an attempt to provoke the audience's consideration about whether or not Krogstad is in any way deserving of such constant discrimination. Unlike the traditional morality plays or melodramas that European audiences would have been more familiar with at the time of writing, none of the main characters in A Doll's House can be seen as wholly good or evil. The realism of such characterisation is also seen in Krogstad's reflection on the possibility of suicide. 
His admission that most of us think of that first, I did too, but I hadn't the courage, is a huge departure from the melodramatic self-sacrificing hero or honourable loser that falls on his sword. Instead, Krogstad maintains the sense that he is consumed by regret, but too afraid to take his own life. This is an attitude that would be uncomfortably familiar to anyone in the audience who has had money struggles of their own. Finally, Krogstad could be accused of unnecessarily turning the screw in terms of his blackmailing of Nora, for he begins to request a more senior position that he had previously held before being fired. But once again, his rationale is hard to argue with, as evidenced when he says, I was content to work my way up, step by step. Now, I am turned out, and I am not going to be satisfied with merely being taken into favour again. Despite no doubt being motivated by bitterness, Krogstad's updated demands have been provoked by Helmer's unceremonious and discriminatory decision. Whilst worsening life for Nora, Krogstad is still making a relatively modest request to ensure he can re-establish his reputation as opposed to something more drastic, such as ruining the Helmer family in some way. As the play enters its final act, the audience is called upon continually to question whether there is any difference between Krogstad or Nora, with the key exception of the fact that Krogstad's indiscretion is public knowledge. Should Nora's illegal borrowing of the money come to light, would people see the Helmer family any differently from the way that they currently see the social pariah, Niels Krogstad? In Act 3, further sympathy is gained for Niels Krogstad when we learn that he was abandoned by Christine Lind, who had been the love of his life. He candidly explains that, when I lost you, it was as if all the solid ground went from under my feet. Look at me now. I am a shipwrecked man clinging to a bit of wreckage. Although not explicitly linked to his financial indiscretion, this failed relationship and emotional fallout does provide some context as to why Krogstad may not have been wholehearted in his attempts to stay morally motivated earlier in his life. Indeed, once promised the hand and companionship of his lost love, he immediately pledges to find a way to clear myself in the eyes of the world. Hence, with some semblance of human affection and understanding, Krogstad's previous bitterness and vindictiveness vanishes. This once again underlines the importance of seeing all human actions as a fraction of a person's character, as opposed to using one mistake to define a person's entire reputation. Furthermore, when Torvald explains to Nora that Krogstad sends you your bomb back, he says he regrets and repents. We see that Krogstad is capable of moving past petty grudges and perhaps recognises the deep sense of distress that he has caused. Before receiving the letter, and in stark contrast to this, after Torvald unleashes a diatribe of harsh sanctions on Nora, the most he can manage by way of apology is to say that he had been angry and that he forgives Nora for the way the exchange went. A far cry from the contrition shown by Krogstad. Throughout the play, Krogstad is forced to wear his heart on his sleeve and be honest and upfront about how he's feeling and what he's going through. Ironically, by having no reputation left to lose, Krogstad is actually more liberated than Nora is, who finds herself constantly anxious or terrified of what will happen should people discover her secret. He is presented as a moral other, someone who inspires fear or discomfort in the characters around him, and also is set up as the play's antagonist. Although he is the source of the central conflict, Audiences come to see that it is actually the Helmer's toxic marriage, which is the true force within the play that causes all the antipathy. Not one individual man who has made one solitary mistake and who is trying to make amends for it. Ibsen might be trying to argue the fact that 
easy targets for condemnation or judgment very rarely deserve complete ostracization in the way that we see Krogstad dealt with. In fact, this may just be a method for other people who seek to blame these outsiders or pariahs as a way to deflect from their own indiscretions that are yet to enter the public eye. If you found this Krogstad analysis useful and would like guides to other literature that you might be covering in school as well as book recommendations, then be sure to like and subscribe via the links below. That's all for this time. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.